Hello viewers, I am Dr. Robiul. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is embolism. In this video, first we will try to define embolism, then we will discuss its common types followed by a brief discussion on the important types of embolism which will include pulmonary thromboembolism, systemic embolism, air embolism, fat embolism, amniotic fluid embolism, etc. Okay, so let's begin. First question, what is embolism? Embolism is the process of formation of an embolus. Then you may be asking Dr. Robil, then what is an embolus? So now I will tell you the definition of embolus, but don't get scared because I will explain this definition line by line afterwards. So as you can see from the board, embolus can be defined as a detached intravascular solid liquid or gaseous mass that is carried by blood to a site distant from its point of origin. Okay, I hope you're still with me. You didn't run away just like my students do when I try to teach them definitions of pathology. I even have to show them Teddy. So look, I am also showing you guys Teddy. So don't worry, stay calm because I will explain this definition line by line. So what did I say in the first line of this definition? embolus is an intravascular that means this mass is occurring inside our cardiovascular system okay so intravascular solid liquid or gaseous mass now one thing you have to remember recall from my previous video on thrombosis and thrombus thrombus was a solid mass but here when we are talking about embolus embolus can be solid or liquid or gaseous okay so it's not only solid so always keep that thing in your mind so going back to the definition embolus is a is an intravascular solid liquid or gaseous mass that is carried by blood to a site distant from its point of origin now what do we mean by that now to explain th that thing I have drawn an image here so on the right you can see this is a vein this is a deep vein from our lower limb you can know this is a vein by looking at these valves recall that veins have valves inside them and as you can see the condition here is not good a solid thrombus has formed here a solid mass a, thrombus has formed around these valves of this deep vein of the leg. Then what has happened? One of these solid mass or deep vein thrombus has detached as shown by the arrow. And then that detached solid mass of deep vein thrombus has been carried by blood all the way to inferior vena cava and through inferior vena cava it has entered into the right atrium of the heart then from the right atrium that solid mass can pass into right ventricle and then when everything starts to get narrower say for example in the pulmonary artery or in the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery or further down the road that thing will again lodge so this is an example of embolism that has been detached from its point of origin and carried away into a distant site by blood. And always remember, thrombus is the most common cause of embolism. So there is often a term used that is thromboembolism, indicating that this embolus has been originated from a solid thrombus. And almost 99% cases of embolism, they originate from thrombus. Okay? so. Now that we have explained the definition of embolism and embolus, now we will move on to the next topic and that was the types of 
embolism. But before going into the types, one important thing that you may want to know. The term embolus was first used by the famous German physician who is also uh, often remarked as the father of modern pathology, Rudolf Varko. So he invented this term embolus in the beginning and that was used to denote those mass that are dislodged in different blood vessels and causing obstructions of those blood vessels. So that is an important thing to know. So moving on to the next topic and that is the type of embolism. So we can classify embolism in different ways. We can classify them according to the matter of the embolus. We can classify them whether according to whether they are infected or not. We can also classify embolus according to their source and according to the flow of blood. And we will talk about all these different classifications briefly. So the first way by which we can classify embolus was according to the matter of the embolus. And this is very obvious from the definition. So according to the matter of the embolus, it can be solid, liquid or gaseous in nature. So what are the examples of solid embolus? I have already given you one example and that was the thromboembolism or thromboembolus. That is the first example of solid embolus. Other examples include ruptured atheromatous plaque. It also includes tumor cell clump, foreign body, tissue fragments, bacteria, parasite, etc. All these things can result in formation of a solid embolus. Moving on to the next point and that was the liquid embolus. So what are the examples of liquid embolus? They will include amniotic fluid embolus and we will also discuss about that in details after a while. Another example of liquid embolus will be fat embolism and bone marrow embolism is also liquid in nature. The third type according to the matter was gaseous embolus and particularly important here is air embolism and we will also see that nitrogen, oxygen, all the gases of the air can form bubble and that can occlude different blood vessels in the later half of today's video we will talk about those things. So this was the examples of different types of embolus according to the matter of the embolus. Moving on to the next classification that was according to whether the embolus is infected or not. So it can be of two types. Whenever the embolus is infected, we call that septic embolus. And whenever the embolus is not infected, we call that sterile or bland. The third way to classify embolus is according to their source. And according to source, embolus can be of four types. They are cardiac embolus, arterial embolus, venous embolus, and lymphatic embolus. So when the source of the embolus is in the heart, we will call that cardiac embolus. It can arise from the left ventricle, especially when there is infarction of the left ventricle. It can also arise from vegetation. Recall that vegetation means thrombus in the heart valve and sometimes those thrombus on the surface of the heart valve they tend to dislodge and that will result in cardiac embolus as well. It can also arise from the left atrium and left atrial appendages as well. So these are all examples of cardiac embolus. Regarding arterial embolus it can occur in the arteries of the brain, kidney, intestine, spleen, etc. Regarding venous embolus, I have already mentioned about the deep vein thrombosis which later dislodges and forms embolus. Now what about lymphatic embolus? This is very important because some cancer, particularly carcinoma, they tend to spread by this way and we often use the term that is tumor emboli. 
fragments of the tumor sometimes use the lymphatic channels to spread and by definition they are tumor emboli and according to source they are lymphatic emboli because they are using the lymph channel to spread. The fourth way to classify embolus is according to the flow of blood and according to the flow of blood embolus can be of two types they are the paradoxical embolus and retrograde embolus and now we will talk about these two briefly. When an embolus is carried from the venous side of the circulation into the arterial side of the circulation or vice versa that is known as paradoxical embolus. Now normally an embolus from the venous side of the circulation must not cross into the arterial side and vice versa. But then why is that thing occurring here? One of the causes is septal defect. Whenever there is interventricular septal defect or interatrial septal defect, embolus from either venous or arterial circulation can move into the other side of the circulation. Another reason for patent, another reason for paradoxical embolus is patent foramen ovale. Now recall from your embryology classes, foramen ovale was uh, seen in the fetal life, particularly in the late fourth week of gestation, it uh, appeared and its function was to make a communication between the right atrium and left atrium in the fetal life. And normally foramen ovale uh, is closed at the time of birth, it, get, it gets closed at the time of birth. But if that thing is patent, that will uh, result in a communication still available between the right atrium and left atrium and that can result in embolus passing from one heart chamber into the other side and that will also result in paradoxical embolism. And arteriovenous shunt which is sometimes seen in the lungs can also result in paradoxical embolus. The second type according to the flow of blood uh, was retrograde embolus. So retrograde embolus means the embolus that uh, travels uh, in the opposite direction of the blood flow and and an important example of retrograde embolus is the embolus that we see um, in the spine which was originated in the carcinoma of the prostate. So prostatic carcinoma, there is tumor emboli formed from this type of carcinoma and those tumor emboli, they spread through abdominal and thoracic vein into the intraspinal vein and this spread is against the flow of blood and it usually occurs when the patient um, coughs or strain which increases the uh, pressure in the body cavity and results in retrograde passage of the tumor embolus. So that is an example of retrograde embolism. So now that we have defined embolus and uh, classified embolus in various ways. Now we will move on to the next uh, section and discuss about some important embolisms. So the first type of embolism that we will talk about is pulmonary thromboembolism. Now notice the term thromboembolism. Like I said that means this embolus was originated from a thrombus. As a matter of fact, in more than 95% cases, the pulmonary embolism arises from deep vein thrombosis of the leg. The commonly affected veins include the popliteal vein or femoral vein or iliac vein. That means a thrombus that is formed inside these deep vein can later become dislodged and through circulation come to the lungs and form a pulmonary embolism. But one thing you have to remember in some rare cases thrombus originating from superficial 
varicocities of the leg or thrombus arising from pelvic veins such as the periprostatic vein, periovarian vein, uterine vein, vein of the broad ligament, etc. Uh, thrombus from these veins can also result in pulmonary embolism in rare cases. So what are the causes of pulmonary embolism? The most common cause include prolonged bed rest and whenever the patient is immobile. Say for example when the patient is paralyzed or whenever someone is on a long journey, you know, say for example a long 12-hour flight, the person is sitting in his seat for a long time, those things can result in deep vein thrombosis and later from deep vein thrombosis we can get pulmonary embolism. So, dear viewers, whenever you're uh, on a long journey, don't sit in one place uh, for a long time. Sometimes you do need to stand up or at least try to walk a little bit, you know, to avoid those type of deep vein thrombosis from forming. Regarding the pathogenesis of pulmonary thromboembolism, like I said, first there will be a deep vein thrombus, then that deep vein thrombus will detach from its site of origin and move or carried along by the blood ultimately into the right atrium of the heart. From right atrium it will enter into the right ventricle and from right ventricle the thromboembolus will enter into the pulmonary trunk. Now two things can happen afterwards. If the pulmonary, if the thromboembolus was large, then it may stuck in the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery. So as you can see, I have already drawn that here. So here you can see a very large thromboembolus and it got stuck in the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery. And if you look at this thing carefully, it gives an appearance like the saddle of a, of a horse and therefore it is known as saddle embolus. Okay, so it can happen in pulmonary embolism at the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk. Then what will happen? Another thing can happen if the pulmonary thromboembolus was smaller or the large thromboembolus got fragmented into multiple pieces then that type of thromboembolus won't get stuck here but it will move farther along the pathway and they will get lodged in the lower lobes of the lungs inside pulmonary vessels and they will lodge in the lower lobes due to gravity. So this is in short about the uh, two type of pathogenesis of the pulmonary thromboembolism. Remember that if the uh, embolus was large, it will stuck at the bifurcation. If that thing was small, it will go farther. And in that case, it will lodge in the lower lobes of the lung due to gravity. Now, one important thing that will be often asked in your exam is about the difference between pulmonary thromboembolism and pulmonary thrombosis. Now, although pulmonary thrombosis is very rare, but it is very common for your exam. You will often get questions from uh, pulmonary thrombosis and pulmonary thromboembolisms difference. So let's talk about that thing here briefly. So what are the difference? The first difference is pulmonary thrombosis originated locally. Pulmonary thromboembolism was originated in a distant site and then it was carried. By blood so that's the first difference the second difference is like all thrombus pulmonary thrombus is also firmly adherent to its vessel wall however pulmonary thromboembolism is loosely adherent to its vessel wall the third difference is in case of pulmonary thrombosis the thrombus will have a head and a tail and the head will have pale color and the tail will have red color but in case of pulmonary thromboembolism head tail all will have similar color 
And the last difference that I will mention is about the line of Zan. Recall from my previous video, I have already talked about line of Zan in my video on thrombosis, but to, but to say in short, line of Zans are alternating dark and pale regions that we see in thrombus. So line of Zan will be present in case of pulmonary thrombosis, but that will be absent in case of pulmonary thromboembolism. The last point that we will discuss regarding pulmonary thromboembolism will be the clinical consequences of pulmonary thromboembolism. So, what are they? Now, always remember, in 60 to 80 percent cases, the pulmonary thromboembolism are clinically silent. Why? Because in those cases, the pulmonary embolism is small and therefore it doesn't um, occlude the entire circulation and in most of the time those small emboli get incorporated in the vessel wall which is also known as organization and also in those cases since lung has dual blood supply so that uh, maintains the perfusion of the lungs despite of the presence of those small embolus. So that is one clinical consequence and that is resolution. What other things can happen? There may be pulmonary hemorrhage and pulmonary infarction. Now one thing we have to remember if the embolus obstructs a medium sized pulmonary artery and the artery may subsequently rupture and that will result in pulmonary hemorrhage. However, there won't be any pulmonary infarction in that case because of the dual blood supply of the lungs. The bronchial circulation will maintain the perfusion of the lungs. However, if the embolus blocks an end artery, that will result in pulmonary infarction. So these were the other consequences. What else can happen if the embolus was massive? Massive embolus can totally block the circulation and whenever more than 60% of the pulmonary circulation has been blocked that can result in sudden cardiac death and sometimes it can also result in core pulmonary that is enlargement and failure of the right ventricle due to lung cause. So these were the common clinical consequences of pulmonary thromboembolism. So now that we have discussed the first uh, important uh, embolism, now we will move on and discuss uh, the second one and that is the systemic embolism. So systemic thromboembolism refers to embolism that is occurring in the arterial circulation. And always remember in 80% cases, it occurs from a mural thrombus in the chamber of the heart. Recall that mural thrombus means a thrombus in the wall of the heart chamber and in most of the cases it is also associated with left ventricular wall infarction and sometimes also associated with left atrial dilation and fibrillation. So other causes of systemic embolism include aortic aneurysm. Recall that aneurysm means dilation of the um, blood vessel and which in this case is the aorta and uh, other causes of embolism in the systemic circulation include um, dislodgement of thrombus which was formed in a ruptured or ulcerated atherosclerotic plaque. Now the commonest site for arterial or systemic uh, thromboembolism will include the arteries of the lower extremity that's in 75 percent of the cases it can also um, form systemic thromboembolism in the arteries of the brain in 10 percent cases and in some rare cases it can also uh, result in emboli formation in the arteries of the spleen kidney intestine and even upper extremity so this is in short about systemic thromboembolism and now we will talk about another interesting embolism which is 
air embolism. So air embolism will occur when air bubbles will enter into the venous or arterial circulation. These air bubbles will then obstruct smaller blood vessels and that will result in tissue damage. So what are the causes of venous air embolism? One cause is surgery of the head, neck or trauma in those areas and the reason behind that is whenever there uh, is surgery of the head, neck or whenever there is a trauma there may be accidental opening of the jugular vein or other veins and that can result in entrance of air bubble in those veins and later when those bubbles have been carried uh, along with blood to some more distant and smaller blood vessel, those air bubbles may occlude those smaller blood vessels and that will result in tissue damage. Other causes of venous air embolism includes obstetrical cause, particularly during child delivery or during caesarean section or even during abortion, air may accidentally enter into the endometrial vein or into the uterine venous sinus and uh, all those things can um, result in air embolism and other causes include uh, during intravenous infusion of blood and fluid however in those cases air embolism will occur only if positive pressure was given and another cause of venous air embolism is angiography uh, during the process of angiography some air may be uh, retained inside those um, grafted blood vessel and later that can result in venous air embolism now one important thing that you have to remember the effect of venous air embolism uh, depends on the amount of air you may be asking what is the fatal amount of air uh, in case of air embolism and in your textbook you will see about 100 to 150 ml air is considered fatal in case of air embolism and also air embolism's effect depends on the rapidity of the air entry that means the more faster the air enters enters into the circulation it will have more serious and more severe outcome and also it depends on the relative position or posture of the person during the time of uh, entry of air into his or her venous circulation. Say for example if the person was standing during the time of venous air embolism air will uh, air bubbles will move up uh, through the superior vena cava easily into his brain and that will have a serious effect. So now that we have discussed about the venous air embolisms, now we will talk about the arterial air embolisms. So what are the causes of arterial air embolism? They will include cardiothoracic surgery, trauma and also paradoxical arterial air embolism. That is, sometimes the venous air embolism can cross into the arterial side of the circulation. Like I said previously, there may be patent foramen ovale or some other arteriovenous shunt that will result in such paradoxical air embolism. And another cause is, like I said, in case of venous um, air embolism, similarly here, arteriography uh, can result in air embolism as well. So what will be the effect of arterial air embolism? Um, sometimes if cutaneous blood vessels were obstructed by such arterial air embolism, uh, the skin may become mottled and there is a term for that and that is marble skin. So we may uh, have that in the patient. And uh, sometimes the air bubble can be seen in the blood vessels of the retina by the help of an ophthalmoscope and one important thing you have to remember air embolism occurring in the blood vessels that supply our heart and brain that means the coronary artery and the cerebral artery if those blood vessels are affected by air embolism that can result in sudden death so that is in short about air embolism and air embolism is as a matter of fact uh, one of the key 
components of gas embolism so whenever we are talking about gaseous embolism we will talk about air embolism and there is another important disease in gaseous embolism and that is decompression sickness so whenever we talk about air embolism obviously we also have to talk about decompression sickness so let's now talk about that so what do we mean by decompression sickness it is a special type of gas embolism which occurs due to sudden decompression it is also known by some other name they include Kaysen's disease and also diverse palsy and uh, sometimes there is another term that is aero embolism especially um, in case of uh, the embolism that occurs when uh, rapidly ascending in an unpressurized aircraft so what is the mechanism of this decompression uh, sickness like i said it occurs due to sudden decompression now sudden decompression can happen when a person suddenly moves from an area of high atmospheric pressure say for example from deep sea or from the lower part of a caisson or from other high pressurized area suddenly into a normal pressured area or whenever a person moves from a normal atmospheric pressure area into an area of low atmospheric pressure so in both of these scenario there will be sudden decompression and that sudden decompression will result in this type of sickness so you may be asking then what is a caisson well and as you can see i have also drawn a caisson here so it is a tubular structure that is used for building bridges and also for building some tunnels and other things and it is a pressurized chamber it has stairs in it so people can climb down into it and these things are used uh, to make foundations of bridges say for example here you can see we have a caisson here so high pressure is uh, given here high pressurized gas is flowing through this thing and that is moving the soft mud and other things away from this tube and that is making this tube waterless so people can go down into the tube and work they can just uh, uh, work and make the foundation of the bridge but always remember a constant positive pressure is maintained in this caisson and therefore the people in the lower part of the caisson they are under high atmospheric pressure now think about this tiny person here what will happen if we suddenly um, take him from here to here that will result in sudden decompression and remember when someone is in high atmospheric pressure the atmospheric gas say for example oxygen nitrogen carbon dioxide all these gases dissolve into his blood and tissue and mainly uh, a lot of nitrogen gets dissolved in fat tissue now whenever that person is suddenly uh, taken from that high pressure that sudden decompression will result in um, formation of gas bubbles especially from the fat tissue and those gas bubbles will uh, combine with one another and that will result in decompression sickness similar scenario can happen when a person is in, a un in an unpressurized airplane if there is a sudden ascent of that airplane what will happen the person will go from a normal atmospheric pressure or low atmospheric pressure to even lower atmospheric pressure and that will also have the same effect that I have depicted here and same thing goes for deep sea diver so you can see I have also drawn a smiling deep sea driver with deep sea diver not driver of course deep sea diver with his oxygen and nitrogen containing tank and he is exploring the deep sea but what will happen if we suddenly pull him away from his high atmospheric environment into normal atmospheric pressure same thing will happen and that will result in decompression sickness now what are the types of um, decompression sickness so we will talk about those things now so the clinical effect of decompression sickness can be of two types they are uh, classified as 
acute and chronic decompression sickness so the acute form will occur uh, due to obstruction of the small blood vessels in the vicinity of the joints and skeletal muscles and in case of the acute form we will have several um, conditions there will be a condition known as the bends another condition which is known as the chokes and also the uh, cerebral manifestation so what are the bends and the chokes this is very important for your examination so the bends means pain that will happen uh, to the person's joint tendon and ligament as those things will get affected by decompression sickness so that is the bends severe pain in the person's joint ligaments and tendons due to occlusion of the blood vessels supplying those areas by decompression sickness so what do you mean by the choke in case of the chokes it will occur due to accumulation of air bubble in the lungs and that will result in uh, respiratory distress and that is known as the chokes regarding the cerebral manifestation of acute decompression sickness they will include vertigo coma and unfortunately if there was severe decompression sickness it can even result in death so always uh, pay attention and uh, remember that sudden decompression can be very harmful moving on to the next form which was the chronic form of decompression sickness that usually occurs due to ischemic necrosis as a result of embolism and it will have some features so the common features of chronic decompression sickness will include avascular necrosis of bones and it will also include some other um, neurological symptoms like paraplegia and paresthesia and sometimes it will also have lungs and skin and other organ involvement say for example if the chronic decompression sickness involves the lungs there may be emphysema atelectasis hemorrhage edema etc in the lungs and i also have a separate video on emphysema so you may want to look into that as well regarding the skin manifestations that can occur in chronic decompression sickness they will include itching patchy erythema cyanosis and edema so this is in short about decompression sickness so now we will move on to the next point and that was regarding fat embolism so the commonest cause of fat embolism is fracture of the long bones recall that long bones contain a fatty marrow so whenever there is fracture that will result in release of a lot of fatty marrow which will obviously include fat globules inside the circulation and that will result in fat embolism but one thing you have to remember most of the cases of fat embolism are in fact asymptomatic however when fat embolism produces symptom we call that fat embolism syndrome and there we will have pulmonary insufficiency some neurological manifestation thrombocytopenia and anemia and Fat embolism syndrome usually occurs one to three days after the initial insult. The patient may complain tachypnea, dyspnea, tachycardia. The patient may be restless, irritated, and it can progress to delirium and coma, and there will be thrombocytopenia and anemia. Why thrombocytopenia? Because uh, when there is fat embolism, the platelets adhere with the fat globules so there is platelet adhesion followed by platelet aggregation and that will result in decreased number of platelet in the circulation and that will result in thrombocytopenia similarly red blood cell can also uh, have same similar mechanism and rbc can also adhere to those fat globules and later get hemolyzed and that will result in anemia so what is the pathogenesis of fat embolism? The pathogenesis will include both mechanical injury and biochemical injury. The mechanical injury is obvious. The fat globules will obstruct smaller blood vessel and sometimes 
the platelet and RBC which are aggregated with the fat globules. They even uh, further damage, further um, obstruct the blood vessels. So that is the mechanical injury. Similarly, fatty acid uh, get released from the fat globules and they can activate certain endothelial cells and they can damage endothelial cell and uh, that will result in recruitment of um, granulocytes so then granulocytes will come to those area and then those granulocytes will themselves release free radicals and also some protease and that will further uh, damage the blood vessel so that is the biochemical injury of fat embolism so that was in short about fat embolism so we are almost at the end of today's discussion. The last type of embolus that we will discuss is amniotic fluid embolism. So let's talk about that now briefly. Now amniotic fluid embolism is a serious complication of labor and postpartum period. It will result when amniotic fluid and other contents enter the maternal circulation during childbirth through a ruptured uterine vein or through a tear in the placental membrane. So it will contain of course amniotic fluid and not only amniotic fluid but it will also sometimes contain squamous cells that were shed from the skin of the fetus. It may also contain lanugo that is the fine thin colorless or unpigmented hair that we see on the body of the fetus and uh, in sometimes in the body of the newborn that lanugo hair may also be present in the maternal circulation we can also see vernix caseosa recall that vernix caseosa is a white waxy material that covers the body of the newborn baby and that can also uh, enter the maternal circulation along with amniotic fluid in amniotic fluid embolism and mucin may be also seen in the maternal circulation so all these things will result in amniotic fluid embolism and there will be um, serious consequences of this condition the patient will complain of dyspnea there will be cyanosis shock there may be um, some neurological manifestations as well and it is often a very fatal condition and it is in fact a medical emergency and therefore it will need prompt and appropriate medical intervention so this concludes today's video on embolism since embolism was a very long topic I recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more about this condition. And also if you like my videos, do comment and subscribe and let me know. So see you again hopefully within a week or two with a new video of pathology. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.